Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to this month's webinar. Uh, there are many new registrants this time around. You know, I usually work specifically with uh, tribal land staff and professionals, but we have a lot of landowners in on this conversation today, I, I saw from the registration. So uh, that said, I think we're gonna have a great conversation about online wills and the Indian land owner. Before I jump into um, some of the uh, introduction to, to Jim and Alex, I do wanna let you know that yes, this webinar is recorded and it will go onto the foundation's Vimeo account in the next day or so. So as a result, if you have your cam going, you will be recorded too. So if you're okay with that, we're good to go. Um, try not to make any crazy faces, you know, and don't wave to your, your auntie down the road, you know, that kind of thing. No, that's not how this works. Uh, unless they see this, of course. Uh, but definitely, you know, be aware that you will be recorded as a result, okay? Uh, you will receive an email with this link following our conversation today, okay? So all of you who registered will get that email along with a link to evaluate this presentation. What we're looking for specifically is whether you walked away from this presentation with more information than you had when you joined, okay? And then, of course, if you have any suggestions for future topics, please share those. I'm always looking for ways to engage the communities that we work with a lot more. So questions and comments should go in the, the, the chat box for this webinar. Uh, those will be addressed toward the end. At that point is when Jim and Alex will have a better chance to look at some of those questions that come up. Um, and also be aware that you know, they're not here offering legal advice necessarily, but they're trying to show you a path forward in online wills and estate planning. So um, the presenters today, uh, my good friend and colleague for the past eight years, uh, Jim Wabendado, I'm sure many of you know him by now. You've seen him around our conferences, but also through his town halls that he presents on um, a, a, an evening every month. And, and then a colleague of his, Alex Clark, who is a community outreach coordinator with Montana Legal Services. So I'm telling you, we have a great presentation lined up. I look forward to hearing this presentation, you know, and, and certainly ways to engage with all of you today. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Jim to begin introductions, in, you know, in a more thorough way for himself and for Alex. And uh, we look forward to hearing to, to hearing this this content. So Jim, please. Thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate this opportunity to address you guys in this crowd. I have been doing various community presentations prior to the pandemic, but as Nicholas has probably shared with you over the many webinars that he has hosted, uh, caused us to look at alternative ways to get information out. Uh, so this is one of my first webinars with Nicholas, and I am very pleased. My name again, is Jim Wabendado. I am Little River Band of Ottawa, and I grew up in the state of Michigan. I have worked for both my tribe as well as the Bad River Band uh, in a variety of different capacities at both organizations, both tribal communities. Uh, but my citizenship is at Little River, which is a tribal community uh, located within the boundaries of the state of Michigan. I have been with the Indian Land Tenure Foundation for just over, uh, just about eight years. Oh, in fact, actually today is exactly eight years. I forgot about that. I joined in 2014 on March 16th. It's a banner day, Nicholas. <laughs> um, I digress though. I have uh, primary responsibilities to address estate planning, community presentations, and uh, various other projects on behalf of the foundation. And it has been a job that I have absolutely adored and enjoyed showing up. And I certainly have missed traveling to tribal communities because of uh, pandemic uh, precautions. I'm looking forward to getting back out. But today I am joined by my colleague, Alex Clark. He works for Montana Legal Services Association. And uh, it seems like we've been working on this project for almost as long as I've been at the foundation, but I know 
that is truly not the case. Um, so I'll turn it over to Alex to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Clark. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at Montana Legal Services Association. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for the introduction and Nicholas for running this webinar and uh, Indian Land Tenure Foundation for inviting me to join. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm with Montana Legal Services Association. We are a nonprofit law firm providing uh, free civil legal aid throughout the state of Montana. Um, I'm happy to say that we have attorneys that are licensed in all tribal jurisdictions in that state. Um, my role at MLSA is I coordinate our outreach. Um, so I manage our Facebook account and things like that and our public education materials. And then I have quite a bit of experience. I spend about half of my time managing technology projects, uh, similar to the one that created this will in a box that we're going to talk to uh, you all about today. Um, I'm joining you from Missoula, Montana, the traditional homeland of the Salish and uh, Kalispell peoples. Um, yeah, I think that's my introduction. Okay. Uh, Nicholas had asked that we have you hold off on questions until the end. Uh, as we go through, please take notes. Please uh, write down what questions you might have. You can certainly put them into the chat feature, at, which will allow Nicholas or some others to address those to us. Uh, as we go through, if I'm talking, Alex may be able to peek. Uh, as he's talking, I may be able to peek. One other thing, and I won't post this for a little bit in case we should get some late joiners, but uh, there are some resources, including the Will in a Box, which is an online uh, will writing tool. You will be able to then access those resources uh, either during the presentation or shortly thereafter. But I do wanna put them in the chat feature so that you'll be able to get them immediately. Uh, let me go ahead and switch to the PowerPoint presentation. Now we do not um, specifically follow this but, uh, word for word, but we will certainly uh, look forward to sharing you with the experience that we went through to uh, put this together. Uh, let me see here. So the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is a nonprofit. Uh, we help to restore to Indian ownership and management all lands within the original treaty reservation boundaries. Uh, and today, Alex and I are going to share with you our experience and this resource for uh, will writing for Indian landowners. Uh, it is currently uh, limited in its deployment. We have not been able to take it to all tribal communities, but uh, that is something that we hope to do. Uh, the need for estate planning is critical. As many of you will know, fractional ownership uh, causes tremendous delays in achieving any kind of forward momentum, whether you want to put a house in place, gain a residential lease, if you were to uh, try to put together an economic enterprise, putting that in place may take three years and longer, uh, which is extremely difficult when you're trying to coordinate that many landowners over that long of time period. Uh, so the need also extends to other reasons. So when we were looking at putting together this will in a box, as we've begun calling it, this online will platform or format, uh, we received grant funding from the American uh, Administration for Native Americans and was originally developed to work for the state of Minnesota and all tribes who comply with the American Indian Probate Reform Act. Uh, it was that first step that the foundation saw to see if this would work, how it would look. And about the time that we finished putting it together, uh, LegalZoom was getting sued in many state jurisdictions by the state bars as a form of legal practice. Uh, and so we kind of backed off a little bit because it caused us great concern. We certainly wanted to provide something for landowners to use, but we did not want to, at the same time, put ourselves in legal jeopardy. So it was shelved uh, for a little while. Uh, dealing with an intestate probate, somebody who does not have a will, will certainly increase the amount of time that's involved in uh, 
going through the American Indian Probate Reform Act itself perhaps makes it feel like there are um, hardships. So I listed a few of the hardships that I talk about quite regularly when I do my community presentations on the American Indian Probate Reform Act, things like judge's discretion. Uh, it takes away your willpower from deciding what's going to happen to your trust assets, your land, your IIM monies. Uh, and that's not exactly something that I think most people would like. Uh, it also has a couple of different mandatory processes that sneak up on people. They're not fully aware unless they've studied the law as we have at the foundation to make sure landowners have good information. But those who haven't studied don't realize that uh, there is a rule called the single air rule. Within the single air, it says that highly fractionated land, those lands under 5%, which is for a lot of us, a pretty sizable chunk of land, a sizable uh, fractional ownership, but under 5%, all of those are going to go to the oldest eligible heir. So if you perhaps had received land, but your brothers and sisters didn't, I would surmise and guess that you probably were the oldest in your family. Uh, likewise, you might find out that your older sister got land that you didn't, and that is probably that little sneaky thing that Congress put in to deal with fractional ownership and to in some ways mitigate the continued fractionation of title for that particular allotment. Another piece that sneaks up is what I would refer to as last Indian standing, but formally or legally it's known as joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Um, and again, that is one that without proper knowledge can sneak up on you. When I was doing one of my probate presentations and APRA presentations in Nevada, in the summer of 2019, a gentleman stood up and talked about his mother writing a will. She had it drafted by an attorney and she gave her ownership to her Indian land to her kids in equal shares. But what neither the attorney nor anyone realized till about a year later is that without stating that that should go to them as tenants in common, the sneaky provision of APRA says that all lands unless otherwise directed will be inherited as joint tenants with right or survivorship. And how he found out is when he went to write his own will for his kids to get his mother's land, he was informed by an attorney who was knowledgeable and knew this, that he did not legally have the capacity to give that to his kids. Um, and so it is something that I talk about regularly because it will uh, potentially cause problems down the road. And uh, will in a box, it's another tool for landowners. Uh, it's something that at the foundation we decided wasn't something that we wanted everyone to use, but it is something that for those who do not want to work with an attorney, may not be able to afford an attorney, would be able to access and at least make their wishes known. Uh, so that is one of the issues that we tried to resolve in putting together this online will platform, the will in a box. Um, the Latin term, the legal term is called pro se for those of us, the rest of us, uh, because as Nicholas may have mentioned, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not providing any legal advice. I can only tell you what we've seen happen in place and to do it yourself is certainly something that uh, allows you to move ahead. And so we want to provide a tool, even if it's something that we would not always recommend as the first course of action. Uh, the other aspect is that for land professionals, whether they be attorneys, brand new attorneys, tribal land staff, even uh, the legal office at a tribe, we wanted to provide this as a, as a resource and tool for those folks as well. Uh, it does allow for landowners to get a head start on the process before they show up on your doorstep. If you happen to work in a land office, again, whether your tribe provides legal services to the individual tribal members, this is a way for you to share something with your landowners that can help them address fractional ownership 
making sure that their estate is prepared for uh, their kids should they pass away. And in many tribal communities, it's a regular occurrence. I was looking at my former home at Bad River and I know in the last two weeks, two people that are not much older than me have passed away. And so it is something that uh, happens regardless of age. So again, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, Montana Legal Services, we strongly advocate that people have a will to address even the smallest of trust assets. Because again, uh, the probate process will normally take two to four years. And with the appraisals being part of that, and appraisals being an even back, bigger backlog. Uh, I can't even begin to guess and tell you how many, how long it's going to take to get probates through because those two things are certainly slowing down the process like we haven't seen in quite a long time. Let me see, document can be edited directly with the client and landowners should you use it as a intake tool. Um, as far as solving problems, Alex, would you like to contribute and, and kind of talk about how Montana Legal Services came to uh, the table with the foundation as well? Sure. Um, so Montana Legal Services has been writing wills for Native Americans for several years now, I think almost at least a decade. Um, we are also have a lot of experience in technology projects, very similar to the will in the box. So it was just a really sort of natural partnership with ILTF. Um, we've developed lots of forms that are a lot like the uh, will in the box that do handle other sort of similar legal issues, but usually in state court. Um, one question, Jim, I had for you, and this is just to clarify. So you talked about the sneaky APRA provisions. Um, writing a will is a way to get around those, isn't that, is that right? Yes, that is yeah. exactly what I meant to get across. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, is there anything else you want me to say about that, Jim, about MLSA or our, our experience with, with technology and will writing? Well, I think the Legal Service Corporation should get a quick shout out. Can you talk about the uh, technology innovation grant? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, so the Legal Services Corporation is congressionally funded um, agency. Um, that gets money from the feds, and they have a program called the Technology Innovations Grant, um, which is an annual grant um, project that gives out money to legal aid uh, firms like MLSA to develop uh, legally empowering technologies. So that is what um, partially paid for the development of the Will in the Box. Um, it's what pays for our website, um, a lot of our other online tools that we, that we have uh, available as well. Um, so thank you, LSC. They do great work by supporting uh, technology solutions to these, these problems. Ah, Jim, right. did you see that question in the, the chat? Um, I do. So that's not part of our presentation. Let me, let me take a quick look at that. Um, what is the difference between a will versus a quick claim deed as it relates to property. Again, neither Alex nor I, or even uh, Nicholas are attorneys, so we cannot tell you legally what the differences are. Um, but generally speaking, the big difference is a will expresses your intentions to transfer property after you pass away, whether it be personal, real property or trust assets. Uh, a quick claim deed specifically can be used at any time and it only removes any rights you may or may not have in a particular property. So where I have seen quick claims used most often is when there's potential for cloud on title and cloud on title just means there might be questions about who has what kind of rights. When I talk about, um, when I do the pres community presentations and, and talk about dealing with acquisition of fractions from your cousins who are non-Indian, 
if you can prove that they own it and have transferred it to you, they may be able to get away with providing a quit claim deed. Again, that's quitting any claims in rights that they might have to that property that's listed in the deed. Um, and that should help to address a number of different issues. Again, uh, if you were to use something like a quit claim deed or someone gave you a quit claim deed, you would want to talk to an attorney to make sure you know what rights were given away and waived or which ones uh, you may have acquired in the process. So a will is a way for you to express your wishes after you die, very different type of uh, tool. Uh, let's see. So I think that one we might address uh, either after in the questions, but at the same time, uh, we may be able to address it throughout the presentation through the chat feature. I do wanna kind of get back to um, making sure that uh, we get through the information we wanted to share today as well. Um, I have posted the first two uh, resources that I wanted to make sure you had access to. So if you go into the chat feature, uh, the will in a box tool is available and the link is provided. And afterward, and when you share it with other individuals, uh, there is a demonstration video that you can share and review as well. So uh, kind of going back to uh, the will in a box. So the development process took a bit longer than we expected it should. Uh, the original will in a box, as it were, was designed for the state of Minnesota. When we looked to take it beyond the borders of this state and to address tribal communities that existed within the boundaries of other states, uh, we had two issues. One, the original developer that helped us put together the design had retired. So when we had to begin the process, we had to find somebody who could work with his earlier work and begin to help us. And we were lucky to uh, come to, uh, what's Bart's last name, Alex? Uh, Bart Earl with Capstone Practice Systems was the developer that we contracted with to finish out the, the tool. And so uh, we were very fortunate in that he was a, a talented developer and had a good team to support him. He also happened to be an attorney. So there were some questions that as we went along, he could raise or we could kind of back check with him. And so uh, working with Bart was important. And what we learned in the design for a product like this is that it is set up as a logic tree, especially as we started to uh, take it to other states. And by logic tree, what I'm really getting at is that there's a lot of forest behind the scenes that people won't see, all those trees. What happens is when you go in, you would select a few different options and it will eventually start guiding you down a specific pathway. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper, but I just wanted to highlight in the design that um, figuring out how we wanted these branches to connect and how they, wanted to, how they needed to function uh, was an important but critical and time-consuming aspect to the de development of something like this online will. So I certainly wouldn't suggest that a tribe necessarily uh, just jump in and do something for their tribal community. Uh, we could work with them perhaps to uh, expand what we're doing here. Uh, one other thing is I look at uh, governing law I have referred to the American Indian Probate Reform Act a couple of different times. This, when it deals with trust assets, will always cover those APRA tribes. And so if you happen to have a lands that exist within a tribal boundaries that sit outside and have their own federal approved uh, probate law or probate code, a probate law is passed by Congress and there are I wanna say about 17 different tribal communities that have a federally recognized probate law passed by Congress. And then there are about another uh, three or four who have federally recognized probate codes. 
those probate codes are compliant with the American Indian Probate Reform Act. And as APRA compliant codes, uh, they also will be followed by the judge, the, administra uh, the Office of Hearing and Appeals, administrative law judges will follow those laws instead of APRA when it applies to those Indian lands. And like I said, in total, between probate laws and probate codes, there are about 20 tribal communities that do not have to and will not follow APRA. Uh, but what we tried to do is provide an all-encompassing tool for uh, simple wills, simple estates for Indian landowners. And that means that it should also include their uh, non-trust assets. If they had a house, if they owned a vehicle, if there were uh, particular cultural items that uh, may not fall explicitly within uh, the local customs, they could certainly use something through the state courts to send those and give those to their uh, heirs and or to other responsible individuals. Um, and so having these jurisdictions took quite a bit of time. Um, we currently have this available for use in Montana, Minnesota, and Oklahoma. We had been working in Wisconsin, but our legal partners uh, got consumed with other activities. And so we weren't quite able to finish that. Uh, as we get into later portions of this presentation, I can go into some of those details, but uh, we would like to continue expanding it. But at this time, uh, the limitations to currently using it, you can look through it, you can test drive it, but legally speaking, you would only be able to use it with an APRA compliant tribe located within those three states. Um, but it is an important tool that again, you shouldn't be aware it exists. And for many projects and many activities at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, we look to landowners and we look to tribal communities to tell us that something is important uh, to them. And we are happy to see what options and opportunities exist to to kind of build out partnerships, but uh, we may or may not necessarily come to a jurisdiction for you, a tribal community that you exist or live within uh, unless we're specifically invited. So that is something that I do wanna share that ILTF doesn't pretend that we have all the answers, but we're happy to work with you to develop those answers. Um, this is something that Alex and I will probably go back and forth a little bit upon in the development process, uh, this is for simple estates. It's not designed necessarily to help somebody who's running a multi-lease, uh, 1600 acre ranch with appropriate equipment, livestock and so forth. Uh, that's probably something that you should absolutely go and find an attorney to help you deal with because that deals with business assets on top of personal property and trust assets. And we tried to stick more specifically with those trust assets under APRA as well as pretty basic uh, personal and real property within the state laws. Um, I mentioned on here gift options. Uh, there were some things that we talked about. In fact, they were in there in the earliest days when in the design and what per capita and per stirpes, they are legal terms that refer to how land is um, taken. Is that right, Alex? In other yeah, words, how, it's, how it's passed uh, down generations is from my understanding. Yes. Yeah, um, so so I, if I'm not mistaken, I think per stirpes, and it's been a long time since I've looked at this <laughs> stuff. Um, I want to say per stirpes means that um, it would go to your named heirs. And if they are not alive when this takes place, then it would go to uh, the remaining heirs. I think it goes to their own heirs. So the idea would be if I gave $3 to 
um, one dollar each to three of my children. Um, their share would be one dollar, and if my child uh, Sophie um, passed before me, then that dollar would be split up between her children. Is from my understanding. Um, it is very complicated, and so is per capita. And we kind of came to this juncture where we got some feedback from some attorneys who said, well, if you only offer this option, you should offer these other options. And it just became really confusing. And we thought, you know, how, do, how would we expect someone to do this by themselves without the aid of an attorney and make an informed decision if we're using all these Latin terms that <laughs> Jim and I are struggling to understand. So um, we actually removed that. And it's pretty simple. It's you have a primary beneficiary and then you can choose to name an alternate if something happens to that one person. So you could give it to your child and um, you know, heaven forbid something happened to your child before you passed, um, you could name an alternate of where that property, property would go um, if, that, if that happened. So maybe a niece, nephew, or even a grandchild. Thank you, Alex. And again, I, because we're not providing legal advice, the key thing I wanted to highlight is that I mean, there are things that go into legal advice and deeper into an understanding of the nature of real property and airship and probate issues that, again, we wanted to have something that worked for uh, the lay Indian landowner who doesn't necessarily have a, a legal background so that they could simply give away to the people that are important to them, the assets they want them to have. So again, uh, when it came to life estate gifts, uh, we did go through that and made sure that that stayed in there. So that uh, again, APRA itself contemplates that spouses only get a life estate in certain properties with a will. You could designate that uh, spouses or other individuals get a life estate and who the remainder interest will go to uh, and copy some of the things that APRA tries to accomplish, but do it in a way that makes sense to you. So again, there was a delicate balance between things that got really difficult and complex. Again, we are looking at terms that harken back to legal definitions from Latin. That was a no-go when it came to practical resources that people are kind of used to seeing already, we wanted to make sure those things stayed in place. I, I list also burial instructions. Uh, in working through this with some of the attorneys, it was highlighted that uh, burial instructions might have a very specific cultural context, and so they would not be written down. Uh, and when I mentioned the logic tree earlier, this is one of those where if somebody were to mark a box with an X that said, no, I don't want to include burial instructions, you're not gonna deal with it. It's, uh, but if you did say that, hey, that would be pretty darn handy to have burial instructions in my will, uh, then you could include those in there. And in fact, actually that reminds me, because we're talking about probate and estate planning issues, uh, it is critical if you have burial instructions either in a sealed envelope with your will or in a place that um, is accompanying with, like in this case, with the will in a box, you could have your burial instructions with the inside the actual will document. Uh, it is absolutely imperative that the will be accessible to your personal representative. Uh, the worst thing in the world would be to uh, not necessarily tell everybody that you plan to be cremated uh, and then you pass away. They can't get at your will until the probate is further down. Obviously, they cannot wait to do burial for you that long. And so if you should choose to put burial instructions anywhere inside or in an envelope even with your will, make sure that those things are easily accessible. Uh, it's, it's a horror story that um, I've heard about several times while traveling through Indian country. So I, I digress a little bit, but um, again, trying to make this practical and encompassing for Indian landowners. 
Hey, Jim, you mentioned a uh, personal representative. What's yes. another common word for that? Um, executor. Executor. Yeah, executor. That's how I've always thought of it. But in, in Montana, we use personal representative and I think a few other states as well. Uh, and that's more of a, uh, a newer thing where uh, people are using terms they're more familiar with. Uh, so executor, executrix are, uh, again, legal concepts. And with an attorney, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. But outside of the legal community, if I said this person is going to be my personal representative after I die, it's pretty clear to almost everybody what that role is going to be. So thank you, Alex, for having us clarify that. Um, I've talked quite a bit, so I'll continue to interject here. <laughs> and, um, but uh, this is a portion that Alex can actually carry quite well. He helped to do quite a bit of our uh, user testing. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Jim. Um, so the great thing about the LSC TIG grants, the Technology Innovation, our initiative grants, is they build in user testing into these projects. So that means that we give a prototype or a you know first draft of whatever tool we're developing and we give it to actual people and say, you know, here, use it. Um, so we gathered a lot of survey feedback from users in Oklahoma, Minnesota, and even Wisconsin and Montana. And then I was privileged enough to do some live user observation um, on the Flathead Nation and then in the Missoula MLSA office. And so what that includes is I'm basically just watching someone fill out a will and I say, you know what, think out loud. Any questions you have, thoughts, comments, um, it's very similar to like if you narrated yourself tying your own shoes. It sounds a little silly, it's a funny process at first, um, but it is so helpful to get user insights on like what are the barriers um, that are, you know, the hookups, the hangups for people when they're writing their own will. Um, you know, things I learned, it's obviously just a really stressful thing. Um, you want to make sure that everyone's taken care of. Um, I think emotionally, that's the hardest part. So what we wanted to do is make sure that the legal concepts we're using, the interface, the language was as easy to understand as possible, just given that that's a, a difficult thing for anyone to navigate. Um, so some sort of implementations we did in response to this, this live user feedback and surveys um, from actual, um, you know, enrolled members, uh, Indian landowners, is we added a page right at the beginning that defined some of these legal to topics. Um, because in the old, older version, we would say, okay, who do you want to give this to? And then we would introduce a new legal concept that no one had ever heard of before. <laughs> Um, and so it was kind of unfair for them to have to make that decision when they're just now like learning this new uh, legal concept. So we have a page on legal terms, you know, life estates, uh, APRA, lineal descendants, other things that are good to know when you're writing your own will, um, APRA compliant will. And then another one on how life or land is owned, which introduces, you know, tenants in common, joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Uh, I think it also covers life estates. Um, the original version had some really nice graphics that kind of show how property is owned. We kept those, those were nice, people liked those. Um, as Jim talked about earlier, we just really try to simplify the options. So this doesn't give you the whole full suite of options that you could get. You know, It's not the uh, souped up Cadillac that you could get. Um, but it's a really uh, reliable tool. It'll um, give you the power to decide what happens with your land um, after you pass. A um, few other things we did. Um, we made it so that you have to actually name your individual children or check their names. And that's more of just for clarity to make sure that your intentions are super clear for whoever is interpreting your will afterwards. Um, Jim, was there other things? Am I leaving anything else out? Yep. 
muted myself there for a second. I um, on there we've got internal uh, oh. quality and assurance. So I I'd mentioned having attorneys work with us in the accompanying states, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to facts and statutes. Uh, here in Minnesota, there are some specific things. In Oklahoma, when it comes to wills and probate, again, they have very specific issues. So when it applies to APRA, it's pretty standard. It doesn't matter where it's going to be located, but if it had to do with state law, we needed to make sure that uh, everything that we put as an available option would provide a legal will, something that would stand up in probate court and work for the testator, the person who wrote the will. So um, we did spend quite a bit of time working through that. Um, I do mention much later that Wisconsin is one of the places we want to complete yet. And the big issue we had with Wisconsin is that uh, Oklahoma, Minnesota, and Montana are what they call equitable distribution marital property states. Uh, so we could use the same format when it deals with spouses. Uh, Wisconsin is a community property, um, marital property state. And so it has a very different approach to how those things work. And that was the state-based legal issue that we needed to address and never quite got across the finish line. And so we've got something that's almost ready to use for Wisconsin. And once we get that resolved, uh, it's something that we could make available to APRA compliant tribes in the state of Wisconsin as well. Um, so facts and statutes were things that we needed to uh, look at very closely internally so that you know we weren't potentially jeopardizing somebody's assets in the process. Again, uh, we're very clear that this is not legal advice, but it's pretty damn close. And so we wanna make sure we're covering our bases as close as possible. So much so that I think there are probably about 16 to 20 times throughout the interview process that we put in a clause that says, if you have questions, please seek the advice of a knowledgeable attorney because we don't want people accidentally doing something that they would regret had they still been alive. Uh, the interview form and flow, uh, again, taking that logic tree and breaking it out so that we could visually see what happens if somebody chooses A versus B or C versus D. Uh, it took some time for us to really map that out and get the, the behind the scenes stuff to work in a way that would allow us to have different states start from the same uh, get-go point. Uh, let me think. I think there are a few other things in the form flow that we just looked at how does it sound? How does it come across? And uh, I think we rearranged a couple of different pieces. One of the questions that somebody submitted in the chat feature I can tackle right now, which is uh, what about those non-APRA compliant tribes like in uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, you would have Standing Rock, North Dakota, you'd have Spirit Lake. Um, and you get out into the Pacific Northwest and the Columbia River Basin, uh, there are probably about five or six tribes that uh, do not conform to APRA because Congress passed laws beginning all the way back in the 1940s or 50s. Uh, but the rash of them, most of them came through in the, uh, I think the 60s and 70s if memory serves. And so those are not eligible to technically use this. So even if you lived in the state of Montana, if you have land that within the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, which is one of those uh, APRA probate compliant codes and is federally recognized, if you mark that you have lands at Crow, or excuse me, Northern Cheyenne, oof, that's a big, oof, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, if it were at Northern Cheyenne, uh, you would be explicitly told this tool will not work for you. And so colloquially, uh, we kind of called it kick out questions. If you said you were, did not have any Indian land, it would kick you out. If you do not 
Uh, if you have lands in one of these 21 tribal, 20 tribal communities, it would kick you out. Uh, and so again, it's not designed to work for everybody at this point. It's going to take some time for us to put that stuff in place. So, um, so that I hope that kind of addresses that question on what happens for those um, federally recognized places. Jim, there's a very similar one that is a great question by Lynette about feedback on testing and did beneficiaries creating the will only have tracks from their enrolled tribe or did they have tracks from all over the country? Does this affect how the program works? Um, and then there's some discussion about IRA tribe and non-IRA tribes. Um, I'll touch on that briefly. Sure. Um, but I'll just kind of echo what you said. You know, this is really a simple will. What it says is the language of the will essentially says like, I give all of my trust land to these people. So it doesn't identify individual tracks. Um, that was a conscious decision we made to keep it as simple as possible. Um, the feedback I got, cause that did happen and that is a very common thing um, was one of the hangups was appraising the land. How much is that land worth if there's mineral rights and things like that? Um, you know, I did this with the family member who had, you know, Blackfeet land and then land up in Flathead as well. And she wasn't sure how much that was worth. Um, so that was a thing where that's, this tool can't really answer that, but it can give you a good start. And so, as Jim said earlier, you know, it's something where you could fill it out to the best of your ability and then take it to an attorney or a land office or some legal service provider um, to, to finish it up. And it'll be in a Word document, so that can be edited as well. Sure. Um, yeah, that is a very good question. Kind of going back through that again is, uh, in the future, it's something that we might consider, but again, for the sake of easy, uh, making it available in a legal format for Indian landowners, we did not push the issue. From a strategic standpoint, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation absolutely recommends that people more closely evaluate what they can do with their fractional interests so that they don't continue the fractional process and fractionate those titles even more. But again, in the interest of uh, simple, this is the choice that we had to make at this time. Uh, down the road, perhaps we might take a look at giving landowners the ability to designate Alex to get you know, this set of interests, Nicholas to get that set of interests, and uh, Lynette to get a third set of interests completely and wholly different from each other. But again, the idea is that we wanted to keep it as simple as possible at this time and get people used to the idea that, you know, this is an avenue they can follow, but it isn't necessarily the only or best avenue that they should follow. Um, I think we'll, this one's pretty straightforward. There was a question about um, if they didn't pass yet technically and their kid passed away first, would they have to, would it go to the their grandkid or would it go could they just update their will? And both of those are options. Um, I would recommend if you have time and ability, update your will as often as is necessary. If you get more assets, update your will. Don't trust that residual residue and other steps in this will will take care of it the way you want it taken care of. Um, and so again, if you know, you plan to give the homestead to one of your kids and they're killed in an automobile accident, you should update that and not trust that your grandkids are going to be in the, have mental or legal capacity to inherit that in a way that's meaningful. Um, should something happen to you sooner? Uh, let's see. Uh, the last piece I'll say about the development process is uh, we've had attorneys go through this on and on. Uh, for our own backside, both at Montana Legal Services and the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, uh, as I said a couple of times, we 
post all over the place. This is not legal advice. If you have questions, seek a qualified and knowledgeable attorney. Uh, but we did have attorneys review these things and say, this is the will that will be produced. Will this stand up in court? Both the, the administrative law judges as well as the county courts who would probate this under state law. And they all provided paperwork to us that said in its current state at that point in time that yes, these are legally valid wills in these jurisdictions. So uh, at that point, we were happy to start sharing this. This has actually been available since, was it 2019 or 2020, Alex? August 2020 is when we officially launched. Okay, thank you. And I did some uh, quick tabs. So since August of 2020, we have had 186 people start the process. And we, those folks have printed or downloaded 48 documents. So we've had almost 50 people in the since uh, August of 2020 that have actually used this as their will. So uh, again, uh, this is legally valid and it will stand up. We'll go through how some of those processes work specifically, but uh, for that purpose, um, we'll jump into how to use the will in a box, um, which will have some slides from the actual software. And then we'll wrap up with uh, the uh, wills themselves. We'll, we'll show you copies of what these things look like. What are some of the differences between the states and so forth? So the key thing, as you see on here, Law Help Interactive ending with 6538 engine. I provided the link in the chat feature. So you will have had a chance to click on that at your own, uh, but you'll want to either start as a guest, which we did a lot of when we were testing or create an account. We strongly recommend both Montana Legal Services and Indian Land Tenure Foundation that somebody create a, an account. It's not, going to cost anything and it allows you to start. And what you would end up doing once you decide to create an account is enter your information. And what I pre-populated in this slide, it shows that you can be a self-helper. I'm filling this out for myself and that allows you to begin the process. Now, obviously Alex and I have been working on this for a while. So uh, we have some deeper access that goes through Montana Legal Services, but uh, that's because we're doing different things for you as individuals and you as land professionals working with landowners, this is all that they will have to do. And eventually you'll end up getting a welcome screen that kind of lays out. So you can kind of start to see what some of these features look like and how the, the overall design looks. So, the outline for Will in a Box follows a very specific chain of events and steps, and it wants you to provide a lot of personal information. Again, this is your will. The only person who is going to see this are going to be you and with whomever you share it with until you pass away. So um, disclaimer, terms of use, the information you'll need to complete the interview. I did use the standard ILTF uh, estate planning checklist. That is one more piece. That was the third resource that we wanted to make sure you had access to during the presentation. Uh, definition and legal terms. These are pretty basic things like what's trust, restricted fee, uh, what is an heir and so forth. Similar to the things you might find in APRA as well, should you sit down and look through the uh, American Indian Probate Reform Act law. Uh, personal information. So for you, your family, your friends, your tribe, and it will guide you through who do you want to have your personal property? Because that is going to be probated under state law, or perhaps if your tribe has a non-federal or non-trust probate code locally, uh, it is possible that some of those assets could be taken care of. So if you've got a home that you bought on a tribal lease, you might need to use the tribe's probate code to deal with that. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that would be considered personal property and you would need to follow what 
the state and or your tribe would dictate happens to that to that um, home on tribal trust land. Again, the questions proceed to guide you through who do you want to have your non-trust real property? Uh, for some of us, we might have land on the reservation, but we might have a home here in the Twin Cities. Um, who do you want to have your Indian trust property? Again, this is specific to um, those fractional ownership interests. And some folks, there are out there, but there are some folks who actually have one over one ownership and they're the sole owner of their Indian property. And I say trust property because the Indian individual Indian monies account are considered trust assets. And so in this will process, you will need to address who is going to get that money, who should get your stuff if anything happens to your heirs. Uh, throughout all of these, there is backups upon backups upon residue. Uh, how would you describe residue when it comes to writing a will, Alex? That's like your backup. Um, so there's a whole bunch of backups this will has. You can name alternates. Um, so I could name um, basically like a number two. I could name my spouse, Brittany, and then um, our child, Sophie, to receive uh, afterwards. And then residue is after that. So let's say your primary person and your backup person, something happened to them, you could choose, um, name these people in the residue. So those could be your grandchildren, nieces, nephews, cousins, things like that. And then there's a backup on the backup that the will and box has, which is the disaster provision. Um, so that's like if something really catastro catastrophic happened. Um, does that answer that question, Jim? Absolutely, and that's kind of what I wanted to highlight is that we tried to build in those backups to backups to backups all the way to in wills and estates, what they call a disaster provision. And that is just something unforeseen happens that almost wrecks your wishes so that it, it addresses those things. And then finally, uh, the outline for this will in a box form and we kind of go back and forth between using the term interview, which is kind of the layman's term and form. Form is what the Law Help Interactive Hot Docs program calls these things. You fill out a form and you get more forms. But uh, so I just wanna make sure that as I flip flop back and forth between those two, I'm not losing people. And so you will end your interview and you have the option to print and or download that will for um, signature and execution. We'll talk a little bit more about what goes into signature and execution uh, once we pull up those documents. But uh, at that point, you'll have printed and expressed your interests. But again, until you've gotten all the right signatures in the right places, it's not actually a legal will. So make sure if you should follow this process or recommend to somebody they do this, that you highlight the need to get signatures by them and by witnesses and a notary on anything and everything that's printed. So we'll guide you through, we're kind of switching gears here. So we'll guide you through what the will in a box actually starts to look like. Oh, sorry about that. Here we go. Um, as you can see, Somebody asked about the different tribes. In this case, uh, Alex almost tried to sneak one by me, but uh, it raises some very good points in knowing how APRA is supposed to work, that it allows us to take folks who are tribal citizens, as well as uh, lineal descendants, those first and second generation uh, non-enrolled Indians. So I'll let you pick this up, Alex, since it's your little trick. Yeah, so I mean, not being enrolled is not a barrier to writing an Indian will through the will on the box. Um, the way I fill this out is just first generation selected, um, you know, one of the tribes located in Montana. As you can see, we we separated them out, um, Assiniboine, and I think um, the Sioux share a reservation, but we wanted to give people the option if they were, you know, of one of those tribes. 
course, you could always write other and describe both of them. Um, so yeah, you, you it just goes from there. And then once you get past this, it looks just like the rest of the interview. Sorry, I got to unmute myself. The one thing you won't see today during our presentation is that uh, if you mark yes, that you are an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe, again, it'll give you the chart of tribes to pre-populate. Or if you live in Montana, but are a citizen of a Michigan tribe or a tribe that's located within the boundaries of Michigan, I, that's where you have the option to write other and, and write it in yourself. So it isn't necessarily a do or die thing that you're a citizen in a tribe that's in another location altogether. Uh, the other thing that you will see in the next perhaps is um, it asks for your enrollment number. Any document that you're going to use in the uh, federal probate process should have your citizenship, your enrollment number with the tribe that you're a member of. So let's see here. Uh, let's see. So yes, yeah, same thing with spouse. Oh no, this is our information. So because again, this was filled out for somebody who was not uh, enrolled, but is a first generation, it does not provide the space for the uh, enrollment number. Um, one other quirk is, especially for women, this is really important. Is there another name that you might be legally known as? Uh, and so when you check another name, it gives you the ability to add that information so that um, you have those formers or aliases so that it still continues to be legally enforceable, uh, contradicting perhaps what's on a marriage certificate or otherwise. Uh, so in this case, spouse uh, shows uh, that this person is this the spouse is a tribal member. And so here you can see uh, it became too difficult to pre-populate all those same tribes again. Uh, so we left it for folks to fill it in. But again, here's where you can see the enrollment number gets added to the process. And that allows for uh, kids as well who are citizens of tribes, grandkids who are enrolled. Uh, any place that you claim someone to be Indian, it gives you the capability to provide their uh, enrollment number. Let's see, for tribe, personal and spouse information, is there anything else, Alex? Or should we just move on to the gifts? You know, I just want to point out, I uh, someone kindly uh, direct messaged me about residue. They described it as not a beneficiary, it's property not explicitly distributed in a will or in the event that a will, uh, a, a gift fails. Um, so that's a more legal description of it. So thank you for that person. Um, again, I'm not an attorney, so this is all sort of challenging for me, um, but I can reassure you that you know we've had attorneys review this and help us out with this and make sure that this is a uh, APRA compliant will as well. So thank you. Um, no, I mean, I just, you know, it's very similar to any sort of form you filled out online. The interface looks a little bit different. Um, we just do as best as a job as we can to make sure that the people named in the will are very specifically identified. So we use tribal enrollment numbers, date, date of birth, um, things like that, you know, relationship, um, and of course their own tribe to make it very clear to whoever is interpreting your will what you want. Okay. So here, as an example, we've pulled up non-trust, tangible, personal property, something that can be touched, handled, given directly by hand to somebody. And again, please, Alex, kind of talk through uh, the different options and how that works. And, and so, the flexibility that it tries to give to an extent. Sure. So if you've told the form that you are married and have children, you're gonna have these options here up on the top. 
for my spouse, my children, another tribe, or uh, other person, sorry, or the tribe. Um, this first question, do you want to name someone to receive your property if your spouse dies before you? Uh, that's what I meant, meant when we said um, alternate. So that's like picking a number two. Um, in this instance, so who do you want to receive your property if your spouse dies before you? That's when you're naming the alternate beneficiary. I selected another person or persons instead of my children. And then it asks you to name or the number of, of alternate beneficiaries. This is kind of a workaround. Let's say maybe you wanted to name your children and a stepchild or a cousin or a nephew. Um, you're gonna say three and then when you enter that, you'll get three more screens to name those people. So you could again, put in your children's name and then other beneficiaries that you wanted to name. Or if you just wanted to give it to your children, you could have marked um, my children up above here. And then the next screen, you would you would check which ones, which which children you wanted to give that to. Um, so basically the point here is there's a little bit more flexibility than meets the eye for naming um, beneficiaries. Um, you're not exactly limited to choosing just your spouse or just your children or just another person or persons. Um, there's a little bit more you can do with it. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and here's what that, that, yeah, that next page looks like. So in this case, as you'll see in one of the wills, uh, there are specific gifts. In this case, um, tools and artwork, Sorry about that. Um, uh, let's see, make sure I don't do that again. And then the next gift uh, is an Eastman acoustic guitar. So it, it does provide, and you see here an example to my sister, Betty Lou Dakota, my mother's diamond ring. So Kind of the old fashioned, you know, important trinkets, bobbles, and, and heirlooms go into, you know, this as because although they are named and named to specific individuals and they include uh, very specific and unique gifts, uh, it's not terribly complex how that process works. So it is something that we want, wanted to make sure was available. Um, I think so here as we talk about Indian trust land uh, you can give it to another person or other persons if for some reason you decide uh, you're kind of mad at some people you could actually give your Indian land to the tribe and that tribe is of course carries forward from when you listed your tribe earlier um, you can do it as an outright gift or as a life estate so in this case um, I think that was one of the earlier questions is what would you do if I wanted to give it to a spouse under APRA, they generally wouldn't get it automatically, but there's nothing that my says my Indian spouse could not get my land, um, especially if they're from another tribe. The tribe might get a little uh, upset that we're, I'm giving away, say, Little River land, which is where I'm from, to somebody from uh, uh, Shakopee, Madawakaton, or Leech Lake, but it's my land as a beneficial owner, and I should be able to give it to whomever I choose. Um, but overall, the general approach would generally give it to your kids. But again, because you're writing your will, you can do it as you choose. So in this case, I could say, I want to give my land interest as life estates to my spouse. And when she passes, then I can list how it's going to work. So in this case, uh, we said another person or persons as an outright gift to two different people. This is what we were talking about before because this can cause very explicit and problematic legal issues without spelling it out, 
we tackled it so that you choose whether it's joint tenants with right or survivorship, or as I always refer to it as last Indian standing, or you can give it to tenants as common. Tenants in common is what most of us think about when we think of Indian land. APRA has changed that approach. Like I said, its default state is going to be last Indian standing, but uh, prior to the 2000s, it was going to people as tenants in common. And so when my father passes away, his 10% interest is split to 5% to my brother and 5% to me. I can take my 5% and give it to whomever I choose. I can give it back to my brother. I can give it to my kids and split it into two and a half to each of my daughters. I could give it to my spouse directly and she would keep all 5%. Uh, but that's the, the idea between choosing something like that. Uh, and here we kind of bring up residue as that legal process for property. So you can kind of see that you still have choices later on what you want to do. Uh, the disaster provision, generally we wanted to provide that if crap hits the fan and, and the judge is just not sure what to do because there doesn't seem to be a clear pathway forward that uh, you can give your trust property to a nearest relative who's going to be Indian. Um, and I think it asks for that information or you can give it to the tribe because we wanted to ensure that trust assets would not go out of trust in this process. And then for non-trust, we had a second nearest relative or a charity and nonprofit. I see Alex here followed one of our old jokes, inside jokes that uh, they would give it to the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. So that kind of walks you through what it looks like if you should try to finish without answering all the questions and it didn't come through very clear, uh, but it does give you a, an explicit warning that um, you didn't answer something and so you cannot continue forward or you cannot save it as is and use it as a completed document. Uh, these warnings exist pretty regular. Um, almost all of the information like your uh, kids, if you say you have kids, it's going to require you to provide that information. So if you said you had two kids and you only tried to enter information for one of them, it's gonna give you a warning symbol just like this that says, hey, you've got another kid. We need their information to complete this process. So uh, there are some backstops to how the interview form works to help ensure that there aren't any loopholes that get left behind. Again, if you should, complete this process and find one, please let us know. We spent hours and hours and months trying to find all of those little loopholes um, and little quirks in computer programming that can uh, mess up the legal process. Well, I am seeing we're getting really close to time. So uh, the end of the interview looks like this. Uh, so your Indian will in a box here where you can download uh, your form, maybe edit your answers, save your answers, assuming you have an account. Here you can see we had an ILTF tester that Alex and I and a few other folks could go in and out of uh, jointly. Uh, the documents, so what do landowners ex exactly get? Let me stop sharing real quick and I am going to um, pull up different sets. So we'll have to do this pretty quick, Alex, because we've got 10 minutes till the end. All right, so I forget which is which. I'm gonna grab grandparent. Should we do a drum roll? Oh, too late. Oh, no, we can cover some of the general stuff. So there are a set of instructions. So when you do the print option, you'll see, um, sorry, I'm moving this so I can look at you while I'm doing it as well. Okay, no, I think I just, can you guys still see that document? I'm sorry. 
Alex? Yep, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, when I moved it from screen to screen, I was thinking I lost it. So uh, review your will, witness and document. So all the things that you need to do to make this official and legal, it goes through and provides detailed instructions. Uh, so again, last will and testament of Joe full name, uh, who's from Monoman County, Minnesota, born, uh, enrolled member of the White Earth Nation. In this case, goes through. Highlighted in yellow that, uh, oh wait, it says paused, but I don't know what that means. Anyway, so because you can see it, you can still see as I'm scrolling, right, Alex? Um, I can't see you scrolling. Oh, let me stop and reshare. All right, so here, as we get into um, non-trust tangible personal property. Minnesota statute has a very specific reference uh, when it comes to uh, minor children. In this case, actually those under 21 years of age, there is a uniform, Minnesota Uniform Transfers to Minors Act uh, that gets tackled. You can start to see grandkids, daughter. Um, that's where the information you put in earlier this has got very specific gifts. So, um, and like the grandchild got a Toyota Corolla, uh, grandpa's uh, hand carved walking stick went to his daughter Marcy. Trust or restricted, it kind of deals with it in a very blanket form. Again, keeping it simple, it does potentially allow for fractional ownership, but that's a choice we had to make. Individual Indian monies accounts. Uh, because you are dictating through a will, it allows you to do it any, well, any way you well please, uh, whereas without a will, intestate has a very clear line on how that's going to be addressed. Uh, here's where residue comes in, trust assets, it kind of goes through uh, personal representative selection. So in this case, the spouse is the original. If the spouse chooses not to, then their oldest child, Jim, is designated to become the personal representative. It actually provides what some of those administrative powers look like and what they are expected to be able to do. Uh, general provisions governing this will. So here we have a list of spouse, children, Descendants. So now we get into some of the definitions that are important for an Indian will. Um, let me see here. Going through. So I'll show real quick. On each page, we're going to have people provide initials. Uh, it's important to show that you're aware that that page is accurate to what you were doing and intended as you get toward the end. You would sign the will. That's only the beginning of the process. Um, you'll have two witnesses. All of the will in a box wills are designed for two witnesses. Certain states only require one, uh, but uh, two is best practice. Uh, best practice also would have you provide a self-proving affidavit, stuff stating that you know you are uh, of sound mind and voluntarily do these things. Again, the witnesses will provide their information. And then you'll have a third witness, legally speaking, which is a notary. So again, it seems to be a bit overkill in some circumstances, but because we cannot tell where these are going to be explicitly used, we wanted to make sure it would survive in all jurisdictions. Um, so again, the witnesses, provide an affidavit to accompany an Indian will. That's, I forget if that's legally required, but it certainly is a best practice. Um, and again, they're providing that they signed it in the same presence of uh, the testator, the person who wrote the will. There is a place and in Minnesota and Montana, you can actually provide for uh, personal property and a separate list. And so we provided in a separate list that people could use. 
I'm going to quick flip over to Oklahoma. Do you remember, Alex, was that remarried or was that, oh no. So, um, so yeah, single, never married, we did as an Oklahoma will. So again, it follows through most of the stuff. We're running out of time. Uh, for the Montana version where it says will storage, there is one last section that says if you have questions, you might reach out to Montana Legal Services and provides contact information. So again, and we're talking about a, the different branches, each time you choose whether you're in Montana, Minnesota or Oklahoma, it's going to give you a different set of results. Uh, so as we go through um, here, you can see when we listed out the acoustic guitar, the tools and artwork, this is where it will show up as uh, named gifts to specific named parties. Uh, let's see. When I drop down, all of this stuff is fairly the same across all the documents. I would wanted to bring up Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a very specific standard for codicils. A codicil in general terms means that it adds to a will, but in Oklahoma the statute very clearly says that um, a codicil needs to comply with the same standards as a will. So we had to provide a different form at the end for specific gifts and it cites Oklahoma statute and how this process will work because it is, um, it requires the same processes including um, it will require you to provide witnesses and perhaps a notary as well. So that's what these forms will look like. Oh, I didn't show you guys that. I am so <laughs> sorry. Why didn't you stop me, Alex? Sorry. you I didn't want to ruin your flow. <laughs> All right, sorry. So codicil, it looks fairly similar to the list, but it does show that um, it has different legal standards. And so you would have to do this in a way that's consistent mm -hmm. with the state of Oklahoma to deal with the codicil. Um, here's where I was talking about the named gifts, how they show up. Let's see, I haven't left much time. Um, so if I go back to the PowerPoint, we're almost done. You know, I'll maybe make a plug. Um, there were some really great questions in the chat that I am just not qualified to even begin to answer. So I would say if you are, you have a more complicated situation um, and you reside in Montana, contact Montana Legal Services Association. We'd love to see how we can help. I think ILTF can make referrals to other um, estate planning providers um, in other states. Um, there was another thing really quickly from someone with the um, BIA talking about how they recommend that people get their ITI reports before a will. That's a great recommendation. And I'd also just like to thank our uh, tribal land offices specifically who help our clients do that because we we um, we advise our clients to do the same before they write a will. And Montana Legal Services can write wills that take into account these more complicated uh, circumstances or even um, wishes if someone wants to be um, go above and beyond what the will in a box can do. We can we can see if we can help them with that. So sure. thank you. Uh, one quick question talks about giving land to the tribe does not follow enrollment. Um, yeah, so that is absolutely correct. If you give it to a tribe, you can't give, in this case, they were talking about, you can't give Blackfeet land at Crow tribe, but you could give a Blackfeet tribal member land at Crow tribe um, through a will. Can you clarify what states this will is upheld in? The three states, Again, our Minnesota, Montana, and Oklahoma. Um, I am sharing the screen. We're looking to increase the covered jurisdictions. I was really disappointed we could not get to South Dakota. Like I said, Wisconsin is almost done, so we'd like to get that completed. 
Uh, next, we'd be probably looking towards perhaps Arizona and five tribes. Uh, five tribes, the Oklahoma portions will work, but they're not APRA. So we could probably knock off about half the list if we got of separate tribes, if we got five tribes taken care of. One other thing I'll quickly wrap up on is uh, digital assets. Uh, at the very end, uh, it was brought up by one of the last attorneys to say that um, they were working on a will that talked about digital assets. And digital assets are things like, I mean, it could be Dogecoin, but we were specifically looking about things like uh, your Facebook account, your Amazon Prime account, things that are designed for you to have access to and have a certain legal standing. And there are best practices on how to address those things. So these are the things that we'd like to do to continue pushing out and improving the will in a box. Uh, quickly, somebody said, can I use this in Washington? Not in its current format. And, um, and also that you couldn't, if you were to try to modify this, you'd be doing it without legal advice, unless you're an attorney. And if you're an attorney, you don't need this. Uh, you could legally do things for you and your friends and whomever you choose to do. Uh, I think this showed up a couple of times about specific language that states heirs receive income from tracts they inherit. So when IAM is distributed to heirs, it may not always be evenly distributed. I'm not clear about that. That's something I'll have to look into because if it's money that's already in the account, I assumed and I had always understood that it goes however you choose to. So that's something we'll have to take a closer look at um, because money that comes into the account afterward may have a different ownership. So I appreciate uh, Andrea putting that out for us to take a look at. And I did say that this is not valid in the state of Washington because it was not designed to deal with Wisconsin, or excuse me, Washington state uh, statutes on probate and inheritance. I appreciate everyone's time. I convinced Nicholas that we would be able to uh, wrap this up. Uh, we could probably keep going for another hour if he let us, but. Uh, I know folks have got things they want to continue working on. Thank you, everyone. I have no doubt whatsoever that the two of you could con continue for the next hour to talk about this. And in fact, I would like to remind everybody that at this year's Tribal Land Staff National Conference, we're having another session very similar to this uh, being presented on Wednesday morning of the conference, April the 6th. So if you have not registered, please do sign up at ntla.info and, and take a look, you know, see, see uh, some of the other sessions that we're gonna have, uh, um, have at this year's conference. You know, it promises to be a really good event. Uh, another thing I wanna say uh, that is that clearly noticing the chat happening in, uh, through all this conversation, the presentation that we have that was really great and thorough is that we need to have more conversations like this. So stay tuned for future programming sponsored by the foundation and some of our partners uh, that will cover more information about Will in the Box, estate planning overall, perhaps, and any other related endeavors, because this is significant, right? This is probably one of the most urgent issues that we need to deal with here in Indian country to protect our lands and our assets. So many thanks, great big thanks to Jim and to Alex for their participation in today's webinar. And many thanks to all of you who participated in some way through watching us or through participating in the chat. Uh, this is very meaningful and very important. And we are sincerely grateful for your participation. All right, recording will end.